Good morning, everyone. This is Kate Myers, Senior Program Officer at the California Healthcare Foundation. And welcome to webinar number two of our series today on driving improvement in SB 1004 palliative care. I know many of you uh, joined us for our first webinar uh, just a short time ago, um, but I assume some who are logging on may not have joined us for that first webinar. So I want to just provide a brief welcome which will be uh, a little redundant for those who were on the first webinar, but I'll keep it brief. I wanted to just um, thank everyone for coming. Uh, the California Healthcare Foundation has been doing a variety of kinds of work related to SB 1004 for several years now, and we're really thrilled to be able to spend uh, several hours today over the course of three webinars uh, trying to replicate uh, a fair amount of our content that we would have presented at our statewide convening that we had been planning for this day uh, and had to cancel due to the COVID-19 crisis. So I just want to thank everyone again um, who's on for a second time, but thank all of you attending for the time you're spending with us today and really excited to get to dig into our uh, second webinar today, again reflecting on the content that we learned from the surveys that many of you completed on what your experiences have been in delivering SB 1004 palliative care and what you are anticipating as you look to the future of continuing to provide SB 1004 palliative care. Um, again, thank you to the planning team behind all of this work, uh, Chris Wallach at the Coalition for Compassionate Care of California. Kathleen Kerr, independent healthcare consultant, and Dr. Ann Kinderman from Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. Judy Thomas from the coalition is also going to um, give a brief hello, and then we'll get into today's second webinar. Great. Thank you, Kate, and thank you for everybody who's joining us today. It's really impressive the number of people who are coming out for the webinars, and it's really exciting. If you missed the first webinar, you'll want to um, look at that recording when it comes out because there's been tremendous progress that's been achieved. I want to thank you all that I think with COVID, it really is showing us the value of palliative care and the need for it to be more prevalent throughout society um, when we're caring for people who are seriously ill. And today, everybody is really um, kind of facing that potential, making this very real. So one of the things the coalition is doing um, please check out our website for COVID conversations. We're starting a multifaceted initiative to really encourage these conversations so the people um, who are going to the hospital are really the ones that can benefit and, um, and that need those services. And um, we need to be able to support the people who don't go into the hospital um, to have the highest um, life they can uh, without going into the hospital. So check out COVID conversations. Thanks, Kate. Thank you, Judy. Okay, next slide. Thanks, Anne. Um, so just quickly, I know this is um, repetitive for a few of you, but just to orient those of you who weren't on our first webinar, um, this is our second of three webinars today. We are on the looking ahead um, item, and we have one more webinar after this one that will begin at 1 o'clock. Um, again, people are welcome to come to one or all. You have individual registration links for each of these webinars if you have registered for them. There were some questions last time about slides and webinar recordings, so I'll reiterate, we will make uh, all slides and recordings of each of these webinars available on the CHCF website within probably about seven to 10 days. And um, a reminder that all attendees are muted, um, but we encourage you to use the chat box that we have. This worked really well in the first webinar, I think, for people to both share observations, make comments on what you're hearing from the presenter um, based on your own experiences, and to ask questions. Um, we will try to address those questions either within the chat box or uh, verbally from our presenter as we are able based on time. And those that we can't get to, uh, we'll try to work with you to answer them offline. So I um, want to introduce our speaker for our second webinar before we get started. Dr. Ann Kinderman is an Associate Clinical Professor of Medicine at UCSF and is the Director of the Supportive and Palliative Care Service at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. Dr. Kinderman's scholarly work has focused on promoting high quality care for vulnerable patients with serious illness and expanding palliative care services in safety net health systems. Related to SB 1004, as many of you know, she helped to develop and deliver the technical assistance series um, through previous CHCF initiatives. With that, I will hand it to you, Anne. 
Thanks, Kate. Uh, so uh, excited to be talking with you all to unpack the uh, other components of the surveys that we did and um, to really take stock of where we are right now and how uh, we can move forward and help more Medi-Cal patients get access to palliative care when they need it. Um, so first, I just wanna I wanna take back. I know it's a it's a really hard time for for all of us, um, not just across the country but across the world. And um, I do think that it's worth taking a moment to uh, to celebrate um, really the remarkable things that have happened um, through SB 1004 um, since it was passed into law um, not quite uh, six years ago. Goodness. Um, so it really was um, a first of its kind mandate for Medicaid patients um, in the United States to um, to require that they have access to palliative care. And I um, I always like to joke that you know for me and having uh, commercial insurance, there's no mandate for me to get palliative care. Um, but I'm uh, so glad that uh, that our uh, legislators had the foresight and uh, will to make this happen. Um, I think that, you know, to get it done from the time that it passed to have it implemented in 2018, um, that required applying lots of lessons from other successful palliative care initiatives, um, like pediatric palliative care and some uh, successful community-based palliative care programs, and then apply that to the Medi-Cal population, which is no small thing. And then we have now two years of services um, under our belt. Um, literally thousands of vulnerable people in California have gotten palliative care services because of this law. And they've gotten those services mostly at home. Um, and I put the home in quotation marks also because um, as Kathleen showed there, you know, people can get services also in um, skilled nursing facilities and residential care facilities. But I will also say, you know, there are many palliative care programs out there that are willing to go into shelters, that are willing to go into people's mobile homes um, to deliver services. And then I think, you know, the other thing to celebrate is that there's really a trend towards expansion of services, and I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, you know, it's two years, um, and so I, I, I kind of like the idea also is sophisticated. Um, and I it's worth saying that in the world of infancy compared to sleep qualifies us as having a palliative care program. The accomplishment and they've learned some good things. Um, there's been a lot of learning, not just on behalf of providers who have um, grown beyond the first two years, but also the plans, many of whom uh, didn't start doing palliative care until this mandate came through. And I think there's uh, there's lots that uh, has been created both through the California Healthcare Foundation and this learning community, the technical assistance series. Um, we've tried to promote these connections across um, communities uh, with public hospitals and palliative care organizations that are standalone and with the health plans to try to um, encourage the growth and expansion of SB 1004. I don't think it would be fair to talk about a two-year-old without um, acknowledging the reality that sometimes there are hard things that come out and not everyone is happy. Just to uh, put forward again um, some background to the data that we'll be using looking uh, at this webinar. Um, this is really drawing from the plan and provider survey that went out a couple months ago that builds on surveys that we did um, capturing the first six months of SB 1004 services and the first year. Um, as Kathleen mentioned in the first webinar, it was around 25 questions in the survey, we were really trying to be sensitive to people's time um, and uh, made sure that these questions were intelligible and thanks to those who read our early drafts and helped make it better. 
Um, our intention was to really capture the SB 104 activities that are happening beyond what was just required to be reported to the state. Kathleen already talked about the structural components of the SB 104 programs, the volume of uh, patients that were referred and enrolled, and I'm going to be focusing on those last two bullets, which I'll get into in some more detail in the next slide. Um, we were really pleased, again, with the uh, participation in the surveys, uh, with two-thirds of the plan, uh, and we think about half of the provider organizations who are providing the SB 104 services. Um, and I will uh, also, as uh, when possible, try to compare and reflect back to our 2018 results. So uh, just for those who weren't able to participate in the first webinar, I wanted to put a couple of our uh, takeaways from the uh, data around volume of patients and uh, what we've seen there. Um, the theme really is expansion. Uh, most plans reported expanded eligibility criteria. Um, uh, with the minority of our plan respondents who had less than 50 referrals, most had over 200 in uh, 2019. And almost half of plans said that their volume was going up uh, of patients or their members who are receiving services. Um, and almost half of the providers reported using video visits in conjunction with in-person. And that, um, though we haven't asked about that before, we're really curious about that. And my sense is that that is uh, something that is expanding uh, in our field in palliative care, particularly now as uh, social distancing is even more important. Uh, we saw that the majority of providers reported at least three years of experience in delivering palliative care. Um, given the timeline, um, that means that they were the people who responded in that fashion had been doing palliative care for non SB 104 patients before that mandate came down in 2018. Um, and then lastly, um, there's a lot of investment happening, um, having dedicated staff uh, doing outreach or on the plan side that are dedicated to SB 104 specifically, doing education initiatives training up staff and uh, efforts focused on increasing enrollment. So now on to uh, what's going to be the focus um, for the rest of uh, this webinar. Um, we asked some plans, uh, questions of the plan specific to collaboration and sustainability. We asked them about their plans to improve or enhance the program in 2020, um, specifically whether they were interested in um, identifying more members, providing education, expanding eligibility, and assessing quality, among others. Um, we asked them about their collaboration with their contracted palliative care partners on uh, a variety of activities uh, that might, they might be engaging in. And then we asked about engaging uh, community groups or organizations in two different ways, um, both to identify potentially eligible members and to connect them with palliative care partners, which we think really gets into um, some of the sustainability and efficacy uh, points that uh, we'll talk about later. And lastly, we asked the plans um, to reflect on whether they think these services are sustainable. Our survey uh, questions for providers related to collaboration and sustainability, um, we asked this parallel question about their plans to improve or enhance their program in 2020, um, and specifically um, to look at this issue around um, of the referred people, uh, how many of them actually accept services, um, things like uh, providing education, assessing quality, and lowering their costs of care, becoming more efficient. We asked them specifically to talk about their strengths uh, that they have as a program, and then also their challenges and threats. Um, what are the things that have been hard to overcome? Uh, we also asked them some parallel questions around um, engaging community groups and organizations, again, to identify member, members, but also to deliver key social services like housing and mental health. And we also asked them questions about sustainability. So the question in kind of taking stock, um, thinking about all of the great information that Kathleen presented on the first webinar, um, where do we go from here? How do we get um, to uh, sustainable, high quality services um, that are gonna last and be accessible for um, Medi-Cal patients and hopefully even more patients? Um, and so I really, in reflecting on the information that we got from the surveys, thought about three different uh, buckets, um, thinking about the strengths uh, that are evident in both the plans and the provider organizations, 
the opportunities that we have um, of what folks are interested in working on and uh, building on the strengths. And then also um, identifying threats, um, those things that are uh, concerns to sustainability and feasibility. And hopefully we can fish that out of this funnel before it gets down farther and creates bigger problems. So first I want to uh, talk about the strengths and the successes that were uh, noteworthy in these surveys. Because I think that it's really important a lot of times uh, as healthcare professionals, we are trained to look for the disease, look for what's going wrong, and we fixate on that. And I think that uh, that is to our detriment a lot of times. Um, there's a lot to be learned from what's going well and what we can build on uh, to improve. So I'm going to talk about these four different categories of the relationship between plans and provider groups, um, our partnerships with a community, the internal strengths to the plans and the providers, and then the things that the plans and provider organizations talk about in terms of what's on the horizon for them. So first, the plan and provider relationship. The thing I was really pleased to see was that almost 90% of the provider groups that responded said that this is um, not just uh, uh, okay, but this is actually a moderate or significant strength of their program, that they have a good relationship with the health plan or plans that they're partnered with. And only two out of the 25 provider respondents reported a somewhat weak relationship. Um, so that is really great to see. From the plan side, um, we asked about areas where there's a regular or frequent collaboration with the provider organizations, which is sort of a, a proxy for how is that relationship going? What are you working on together? And we found that almost 70% of the plans uh, who responded to the survey said that they were directly engaged in coordinating care and uh, case management. So specifically looking at things like a regular um, interdisciplinary meeting to actually talk about patients who are enrolled and how to improve care for those specific patients and also to do this really tricky work um, across health and social service agencies to do the case management work for these very complicated patients. Almost two thirds um, reported uh, frequent or regular or frequent collaboration across multiple areas, including social service referrals, mental health referrals, securing authorizations for various things, could be um, durable medical equipment or medications, and uh, identifying potentially eligible members. So there's really a lot of great uh, collaboration that's going on between the plans and providers. In terms of uh, connecting with a community, most of the plans are focusing, uh, reported focusing on reaching out to clinical groups that can really help to identify potentially eligible members since we've reflected on the fact that the information that the plans have internally is really doesn't get you all the way there to um, figure out who's eligible for SB 1004. It gives you a, a sense, but it, you still have a lot of work to do. So accordingly, the plans have done a lot of work um, to reach out to particularly clinical groups. So almost, uh, so three quarters of the plans that responded said that they reached out to primary care groups and specialists. Um, almost 70% had reached out to inpatient palliative care programs. That is uh, a significant increase from what we saw on the 2018 survey, so that's fantastic to see. Um, and also, again, almost two-thirds had uh, focused on working with hospital discharge planners and social workers, which is nice to see because I think there's recognition that some of the non-provider staff um, are sometimes more able to see the patients who come in again and again, and also um, that the hospital is really a point of crisis uh, where these sick patients are demonstrating that they may be entering a period of decline and um, approaching the end of life and are really in need of help. There are also um, a lot of the plans are reporting connection with their other plan programs, like the Health Homes Program, recognizing that there's a lot of overlap between the services that they're providing, and then we should be looking for um, patients not just within um, the searches of claims data and authorizations data, but also um, who else is getting uh, services who have serious illness. 
Over half of the plans are uh, making connections with the provider partners and inpatient palliative care, other specialty providers, uh, primary care, and other plan programs, which is nice to see. And uh, uh, over three quarters of providers are also working with inpatient palliative care, hospital discharge planners um, to identify patients. There's a lot of focus on acute care, which is makes a lot of sense. Uh, there's, uh, for social service needs, uh, providers, we ask them about the efficacy of their partnerships with uh, different community services to meet social needs. And uh, the greatest strength there, which was not, uh, I'll be honest, not super strong, but uh, the, the best partnerships that people had were with uh, uh, organizations that met transportation needs, which is, uh, makes sense given that that's now um, much more mandated through the plan. In terms of internal strengths, um, most plans are collaborating with their other internal programs, as I mentioned, to identify potentially eligible members. So it's nice to see that those uh, connections are already there, that collaboration is already there, and that's a lot that we can um, harness to, uh, to expand what's happening uh, in enrollment. Uh, providers, uh, their strengths, they say they know the population well and they know palliative care. Over 90% of providers report um, having experience with the Medi-Cal population as a particular strength. So one of the things that we were curious to find out about when uh, SB 1004 um, came into implementation was um, how comfortable would providers be with the specifically the vulnerable Medi-Cal patient population. And what we're seeing is that a lot of the folks who at least were responding to our survey have a lot of experience there, which is nice to see. Um, and also, a lot of the providers report experience delivering palliative care as a strength, that they have uh, been doing this for a while. They know what they're doing in this space as distinct from hospice and distinct from home health or other services. Some other things that we got in the qualitative responses, um, that there are some, uh, some of the palliative care providers that have joint commission certification. They have really strong staff with a lot of compassion and um, skill in palliative care in, in specifically, specifically. And then also their uh, reported strengths in doing uh, telemedicine. Uh, so again, there, it's nice to see that uh, those services expanding. And then the last uh, set of strengths and successes that we can build on are um, the, the ways that these organizations are looking towards the future was encouraged to see that the majority of plans and provider organizations reported that they said that these services are definitely sustainable from their assessment in the beginning of 2020. So it was over half of plans and uh, almost 70% of providers. And I think there's some, um, there's some others, another side to this coin that I'll get it into in a few moments, but I was glad to see that at least for the majority, um, it feels like these services um, are sustainable and can be continued. In terms of looking ahead to what uh, these organizations are interested in focusing on for 2020, most of the plans um, reported that they're interested in working on educating referring providers about the benefit. And the providers were very eager, had a lot of different things that they wanted to work on. So over three quarters of the providers um, said that they wanted to work with a plan to identify more patients. To increase that conversion rate from the uh, members who are identified and referred to those who actually enrolled in services, educating referring providers, and then strengthening the relationship with the plan. And I underscored the educating uh, referring providers here because I think that that's a nice opportunity um, where there may be some good alignment between the plans and providers in terms of what they want to work on in 2020. So just to take a moment to reflect here, um, there are some solid relationships between the plans and provider organizations and lots of various collaboration. The plans and providers are investing in the connections with hospital-based providers in particular. Um, there are more provider organizations that are now established in delivering community-based palliative care, and so there's a lot um, of uh, experience to build on. And I think, uh, like I mentioned just a moment ago, uh, Focusing on how your interest and your intentions may present new opportunities to collaborate in 2020. So now on um, to the threats. I think it's uh, just as important to focus on the successes and the strengths 
it's really important to identify the problem areas before they turn into bigger issues. So the two main um, themes that came up here in the survey were uh, the fact that enrollment is uh, not as high as, it, as some of the organizations had hoped for, and there are concerns around how to make all of this work financially on an ongoing basis. So the first threat around that there are fewer uh, patients or members enrolled than might have been hoped for, this was a top concern for plans and providers when we asked them about their threat. So it was, it was less than half of the plans, but uh, a good proportion of the providers. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, almost half of the providers worry that this is going to impact their service sustainability. When you think about all of the services that are required under SB 1004, it's really a pretty broad spectrum of services. And if you don't have enough um, patients that are enrolled, then you have to have all of these staff that are dedicated to it, but not um, enough revenue coming in to actually support that program. So the economies of scale are really important uh, for the provider organizations in particular. In terms of what's contributing to the uh, patients uh, fewer enrolled than desired, um, I will mention here one of the questions that came up in the first webinar is what are the, some of the reasons that patients um, don't accept services or the challenges? And I would refer you back to um, a lot of the resources that are on the SB1004 website that we've highlighted over the first um, year of SB1004. Um, but some of the contributing factors that came up on this survey, uh, over 60% of providers reported that there's a moderate to significant barrier because of the fact that referring providers are not specifically introducing palliative care benefits to their patients. Um, and we ha have heard this um, for years now around the um, mistrust that's uh, present sometimes with uh, vulnerable patients and the lack of familiarity with palliative care. So how beneficial it is when you have referring providers who actually specifically talk to their patients about why palliative care would help them. And if that's not happening, then that can be a big barrier. Also note here that um, there's a good number of providers who have really limited access to the clinical data. And as um, those of us who are uh, working in palliative care know, you actually need clinical data to figure out even who's eligible. So that's a barrier. Um, about one in five plans uh, reported a concern that members are being referred too late to get significant benefits. And that's, uh, that's a concern around quality and the uh, outcomes that we're gonna see from, uh, from the services. But it's also, to me, makes me worry that we're missing people altogether. So the next big threat is this kind of concern around um, the finances, and uh, we're still working on this service reimbursement balance. So about one in five plans that responded to the survey has a moderate concern about the cost of the program outweighing the savings, that they're investing more than they're seeing in cost savings. Um, on the provider side, it's a much more frequently reported concern, so almost 70% reported this as a moderate to significant threat to sustainability. So this is the other side of the coin. While providers think that these services are sustainable, they really do identify this as one of the bigger areas of concern when they do think about sustainability. And uh, one of the reasons that that's an issue is um, just the complexity of patients' needs in this population. There's so many psychosocial needs that come up that are not traditionally um, accounted for when you think about hospice services or other things um, that are often present in the palliative care organizations, and um, they're having to invest a lot more to make that work. And for the organizations that are doing the fee-for-service billing, um, they, they highlight challenges of doing that, of just um, the extra investment um, and infrastructure that's needed for that billing, and also just the reimbursement rates not being enough um, to sustain them. So I wanted to go back. All of these concerns that were raised in this survey reminded me of something that Kathleen had brought up in our technical assistance series. Uh, back in 2017, where we really think about um, uh, this balance between the scope of services or effort that's required uh, going into caring for patients, the amount of payments, 
and then the outcomes that you want to have that justify that payment um, and that investment. And this is a very dynamic um, balance. So, you know, if you uh, have been working at SB 1004, you're a provider organization, and your effort has been way higher than your reimbursement, that's a big threat for you to be able to continue um, delivering those services. Um, on the other hand, if you're a plan and you have been particularly generous with your investment, but you're not seeing the outcomes, um, that is a concern on, on that side. So I think that um, now, two years in, is a really good opportunity to come back together and look at what we've learned and look at this balance yet again. I will highlight um, some smaller but real concerns here um, quickly. So there are particularly some challenges of being rural palliative care providers and finding um, or being a rural palliative care provider. Um, staff turnover, uh, particularly recognize that plan staff assigned um, to oversee this have turned over and that reestablishing those relationships is hard. Um, the effort to connect um, with a plan uh, with patients remains really high. Um, so even if you get their uh, contact info, they don't have a phone, they haven't had a, a home, so they don't come to their appointments, so it's hard to get them. Uh, their competing priorities, both on the provider side um, with their other service lines and from the plans, the other things they're responsible to do. And um, one organization highlighted this mismatch between um, desire to collaborate on marketing and what's actually happening. So these threats um, that I think are really important um, to focus on in 2020 are how to work together to address them, enhancing enrollment and finding the right balance. And I think the nice thing is that there's alignment and that both plans and providers um, realize these threats and want to work on them. So um, with the last few minutes here, I want to talk about the opportunities that we can seize um, in these different buckets. Uh, so for the plan provider relationship, things are already in a good place. Um, as I mentioned, the, this is a strength for a lot of the providers who responded to the survey. And yet, over three quarters of the providers, they want to work on this. So this is something any relationship takes effort and takes investment. So, um, so let's uh, continue working on those relationships. Um, one opportunity that came out through the surveys is that only a quarter of plans said that they've connected providers with their other programs like health homes, which I think could really be a win-win um, to both identify patients earlier and possibly have a better conversion um, rate and less strain if there's that direct connection between, say, health homes and the palliative care providers. With community partnerships, um, providers continue to highlight that there's a lot of complexity of the patient psychosocial needs, but almost none have effective partners who can address, address significant mental health needs or substance use disorders. So since plans have those connections, it um, would be a great opportunity to help enhance those connections. Um, and um, for our population is with Medi-Cal, um, most providers still don't have a good effective partner to address food insecurity, which I think in, um, with COVID is going to be even more vital. Um, uh, so I'll also mention um, with health homes, uh, CBCNEs are critical there, and uh, that's a great opportunity um, to facilitate those connections. For internal strength, um, plans and providers are uh, leveraging relationships with hospital-based providers, but uh, less than a third uh, of the providers are collaborating with clinic-based palliative care programs. Now, see, I know that there can be a sense sometimes around competing for patients, but I would say that um, as a, a palliative care provider who's helped to stand up a clinic program, there are many patients who we know we can't serve appropriately who really need home-based services. So this is a great opportunity to partner with clinics. Um, and most plans report uh, regular or frequent involvement with referrals to social service and mental health, but um, they're not really using these services to help identify patients. And I think that that's a way that we can maybe find patients earlier on. Lastly, as I've mentioned, there's great alignment in terms of thinking about focusing on um, referring provider education in 2020. Um, one thing that came out in the technical assistance series as a best practice is thinking about co-branding for doing these um, education efforts together, kind of having the logo of the plan and the logo of the provider together to say we're in this together delivering these services. 
Um, and there may be opportunities for engaging more community organizations, really um, making more concrete the connections between the palliative care providers and these uh, community organizations uh, involved in social services that the plans are already connected with. There's uh, a, a hope and intention to focus more on quality measurement and quality improvement, which is fantastic, um, and I think will really help inform that balance between outcomes that are desired, the payment, and the scope of services. So um, just in reflecting on these opportunities, the plans I think are in a really good position to help make these connections between their internal programs, their social service providers, and CBCMEs. Um, there's already been a lot of groundwork that's been done to link clinical partners, but there's acknowledgement that referring provider education is never done. So people turn over or they forget about what's going on, they're distracted by the most recent thing, and so we have to go back and remind them about, uh, about palliative care. And I think that with more experience and hopefully more data, 2020 is a great opportunity to, re to revisit that balance between scope, payment, and outcomes to optimize for sustainability. I just wanted to take a, a couple minutes here to brainstorm, um, and this kind of came up in the first webinar in some of the questions and comments about other non-traditional uh, healthcare professionals or social service professionals, community organizations that might be key partners to think about directly involving in these uh, palliative care services. And so I have a, a few examples here to highlight. The first example is, uh, is mentioned in the first webinar around community health workers or patient navigators. We saw that 18% of palliative care providers who responded to the survey said that they incorporate um, community health workers. Uh, that's fantastic. They're using them in very different ways. I think that uh, community health workers have been really effective in doing uh, advanced care planning in, um, uh, in different articles that have been published. But also, I think, in introducing palliative care more as a peer and as a trusted member of the community. Um, to get over some of these mistrust issues. Um, a lot of people are using uh, community health workers and patient navigators um, who are bilingual or bicultural to really be ambassadors to different communities to, um, to talk to them about palliative care and to then feed back also to the palliative care and to the plan um, about what are the barriers that we can uh, address more head on. Uh, for, for us in San Francisco, particularly in an urban context, um, we think about working with our folks who work in supportive housing and our community case managers for people who are socially isolated and um, may not be living with family. So uh, for folks who live in public housing, it may actually be the front desk staff of that building that recognize that that person is slowing down and is not out and about as much, and they're looking uh, thin, they're looking weak. Um, so if you can partner more effectively with people in those positions, you can actually identify patients farther upstream and recognize, uh, provide them the benefits um, over a longer period of time and potentially avoid some of those unnecessary hospitalizations and visits to the ED. There was a specific question that came up in the first webinar around are these services being provided to homeless patients? And though we didn't ask about that specifically in um, our survey, this is for sure happening. Um, and I think that one uh, group to particularly partner with um, as the palliative care organizations are our homeless outreach teams and homeless care providers who are really the content experts in um, working and find, working with finding um, and uh, having trust with our uh, homeless neighbors. And I think the thing that I would highlight around all three of these different um, types of social service staff is that it's not just about identifying patients, but it's actually about working with these patients once they're enrolled and providing the extra layers of support that they need and the content um, expertise that they have um, and the situational expertise that they have to support patients. Our lessons learned um, from the first year, um, I've said a, a few times already that it's just critical to leverage trusted relationships 
to overcome skepticism and mistrust and go from patients referred to patients enrolled. Um, specifically, there's some language that we've heard um, that if you talk about how these services are free, if they actually are less attractive, it feels fake or it feels like something you don't want. Um, instead, using language around it's covered by your plan. Um, and uh, really focusing on this transfer of trust from a, provide, a trusted provider and uh, patient relationship, transferring that to a new palliative care provider. And then actually um, having provider to provider conversations about patients who are potentially eligible between um, a staff member from the palliative care organization uh, provider to the referring provider. It's really important to meet patients where they're at initially just help whatever their immediate needs are and then um, provide the additional services like advanced care planning and more traditional palliative care services once you're able to address those immediate needs. Um, and I think it's just critical to remember that these service development, uh, this process is iterative. Uh, it's not a one and done. It needs um, revisiting. And the programs are dynamic as we've seen the staff um, change and you need to adjust over time. So I just wanted to say, end of year two, um, it may feel like you've had some uh, mistakes, some uh, roads that were built in a direction that ran into a wall or other things, but it's really important to step back and think about um, the successes that you've had and where you want to go from here. I have some reflection questions that I will put up as we um, uh, have a couple of minutes for questions, but encourage you all um, in the hour that you have if you're working with your team to think about these questions um, and think about them with your team uh, in the days to come. And with that, I will we'll, uh, give that our last minute or two for questions. Thank you so much. And uh, this is Kate Myers again. And uh, what a wonderful presentation. Thank you for, for all of your work and your presentation today. There were, uh, there's a lively conversation on chat about a number of points that you raised. Um, and some are more observations than questions, but just a few things that I wanted to highlight. And then, Anne, if you wanted to um, have any uh, concluding comments on those. One is uh, a person made a point, very good point, as you were discussing the homeless population, that um, their organization does provide care to that population and other similarly complex populations, but it can become confusing for members who might have duplicative services through, for example, whole person care or other county-based or other even plan-based programs like health homes. So that, that um, participant emphasized the importance of clarifying roles and aligning with other partners where there might be overlap. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, there was a, a couple different sets of comments around the question of strategies for early identification of potentially eligible um, people. And there was some discussion back and forth about the value of sort of triggering or use of algorithms uh, to trigger referrals versus direct referrals from provider organizations. And there were comments um, pro con on both sides. So I think it goes to show the different strategies are work in different settings. Um, but it's important to look at the full um, set of opportunities for identifying patients. And um, perhaps if something's not working, looking to other strategies. And then finally, one um, comment that I thought was helpful to emphasize when you were discussing this sort of service and reimbursement balance, um, one plan commented that they, they found that the savings they were seeing in inpatient and ED utilization were somewhat offset by the program costs and other costs that came up, like um, related to use of DME or other services related to social determinants of health issues, but that overall that plan has still seen that the savings have outweighed the costs. So I thought that was an interesting set of observations about where services and costs um, show up. So those were some of the things I pulled from the chat, um, but any reflections on those or final comments that you would make, Anne? No, I think that's all great. I'm glad that there is um, a lively conversation going on um, during the presentation. And I could not agree more with the comment that um, with more investment um, of, from different organizations in um, specific patients, it can absolutely be confusing to patients about who to call for what. And so I think it is absolutely critical that there's conversation between the palliative care organization and the other provider, whether that's um, whole person care, health homes, whoever, around who is running points. 
um, so that the patient has a single point of contact and that those two organizations are clear on that um, so that they can coordinate as best as possible. Fantastic. Thank you again, Ann Kinderman, for this wonderful presentation. And um, I will, again, as with the first webinar, I'll leave the um, webinar and the chat up for about three or four more minutes if folks want to add any other comments or questions to the chat that we could hopefully get to offline. Um, and with that, we hope to see um, most or all of you at our last webinar for the day, which will begin in one hour. And again, remember that you need to use a, the separate final login that you got for that third webinar in order to access that. Thank you so much, and we'll see you or talk to you all in about an hour. <laughs>